Well, you talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome. My question to you is, what has been the nature of the, re the responses that you've been getting? What I'm getting uh, from white audiences is, a, one, a much more thoughtful look at it, because the fear, the pushback is, are you getting ready to try to blame me for something? Are you getting ready to try to get something from me? Is this about, well, it's not about you. And when they realize, it's really not about you. They're able to listen, and when they listen, um, it makes sense. It's certainly plausible. It's certainly something that, uh, you know, is reasonable. And either they are silent or they are in support. The argument that you've so brilliantly raised about the impact of post-traumatic slave syndrome, does this apply just to the peoples of color who were victimized by it? Or were people who were melanin poor, as I like to say, uh, <coughs> did they suffer in carrying out this process? Of course they did. Of course. It's impossible for it, that not to be the case. However, it is difficult to tease out what I would consider to be a pathology if, in fact, you're the one winning. <laughs> you see, <laughs> one would not look at that and go, but wait a minute now. We're winning. We have all the goods. We, we're, we're in control. Well, that doesn't mean you're not twisted. <laughs> okay. Um, but there, there's the assumption of uh, the accumulation of goods, power, and control over those things, which would suggest success and uh, superiority and okayness. And it's not. And as a matter of fact, a very good example of that, I mean, Katrina showed us all, but um, I think that our inability, particularly Black, white people to engage in a discussion, let me be very clear about that, about slavery without becoming extremely defensive, attacking, um, you know, amazing. Because when you just say, you can't get the whole word out, slavery, without people saying, oh, wait, stop it. No, you're sh we, are you trying to find an excuse? Are you, are you people just unwilling to take responsibility? I mean, this is before you get the whole word out. But you can get out Holocaust. Yes, you can get that out. You can talk about it at length. You can talk about it a lot. You can talk about multi-generational trauma with every other group except Africans. And that always amazed me. And to me, that is, if nothing else, a symptom of an elephant in the room that Europeans are terrified to address. And I'm not, I mean, basically what I hear, um, what, you know, literally when I say to people, what, what, what is it that you're feeling? You know, I literally had a conversation in the airport two days ago. We just, you know, I've been in there way too long. This is one of those terminal experiences where you, you know, we're in there way too long, you start talking to strangers. It was one of those kind of things, and we ended up in a conversation, and this gentleman said, when I said post-traumatic slave syndrome, I saw his body change. And it was <laughs> wonderful because here's an opportunity for me to do a little research, you know. So as we engaged in the conversation, all of the pushback was there. Well, are you trying to say? I'm going, you haven't really heard what I've said. But I'm curious about what your, con what your concern is. He says, well, I can tell you what white people's immediate concern. I mean, by the end of it, we were all good friends. But in the interim, in, when I brought the discussion up, the pushback was there immediately. And he says, he says the first thing white people are going to think is, do I have any, um, com you know, am I somehow associated with this? Is there any blame associated with me? Do I bear any responsibility? That's the first personal response that's there. So why is that your response? I'm not talking about you. Talking about African American people, why is is that your response? And again, that speaks to the injury, whether it's guilt or fear. There's a book, Gil, came out this year, um, 2006. It's called Breaking Rank by Norm Stamper, 34-year white police veteran, chief of police for San Diego, chief mm -hmm. of police for Seattle. Mm -hmm wrote a book called Breaking Rank. He has a chapter called Why White Cops Kill Black Men. And his, he surmises, is it's due to fear. A fear, fear of black men. And he goes so far as to say, the bigger and the blacker, the greater the fear. You have the gun. You have the weapons. You have the power. Why are you afraid? And how much of that fear has to do with what you know is an inherent consistent and historical injustice and that this individual you're stopping might be a little upset about that the singers have a how difficult it is for us to engage in that we can talk about japanese internment we can talk about jews and holocaust we can talk about native americans and the issue of colonialism we can even talk about aboriginal people in you know the other side of the world mm -hmm.
can't talk about Africa, Africans, and slavery. You get punished for that. And that, to me, was the first indication I needed to look at it. Are Native Americans' sufferings factored into your presentations, or is it ever raised? It's always raised, um, you know, and I think that, uh, of course, uh, there's, when you begin to look at the research that's been done, I don't know if you're familiar, if you haven't interviewed Maria uh, Braveheart Yellow Horse, who is doing uh, complementary work yeah. with mine. I work with Maria, you know, yeah. uh, so clearly, as a matter of fact, I was, I was reading her articles when I was doing my research. Wow. So when I, she started looking at multi-generational trauma as related to indigenous people, of course, you know, there's a, clearly a, a, a linkage. Moving uh, towards the present day scene, we see um, a lot of trauma in the inner city. I'm oh. sure you've been pummeled with this, but uh, we need to get from you your analysis of what's going on here and what it purports for the future. Um, a lot's going on. Um, I think that when we begin to look at urban settings, you, you cannot separate out. There, there, are, there are parallel processes that are going on that I believe on a general level. You have a level of disintegration that's going on. You have a level of rebuilding and integration. The disintegration is rapid. And it's a disintegration on a number of levels, materially, economically, morally. I mean, you can just go down the list ecologically. In my field, uh, the focus, the buzzwords of, of 2006 is certainly evidence-based practice and the notion of ecological systems perspective, person in environment. Well, let's look at the persons in their environment and what in that environment is fostering healthy behavior and what in that environment is, is fostering um, non-productive and unworkable mm -hmm. kind of behavior. And so one has to look at that as a social scientist. And I would submit to you that the differential treatment, which has been consistent in this found in this in this in families that we've seen, families are looking out and seeing the inconsistencies of differential treatment in a country that says send us your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, and one then wants to take a look at is the playing field balanced? Has it ever been leveled? Uh, is you know some folks don't have bootstraps to pull themselves up from, others do, but what is it that we're working with, and what is it that America is telling urban America? What is the media speaking to in terms of urban America? What do, for, in, other, in other words, let me ask you a very simple question. How does a 16-year-old African-American male living in the projects, how does he get respect? How does he do it? A gentleman by the name of um, Howard Stevenson, Penn, um, Penn State University, um, he advanced some work with young boys. He has a program called Play where he's using athletics and sports to deal with issues of anger and violence. Long story short, he started to look at what works, what doesn't. He was able to affect school be, uh, performance, academics, through simple things. One of them, key, was respecting them. Key, touching them. Now that's an amazing thing. He says, because you see, they are truly the untouchable in today's society. They're the untouchables. They don't feel touched. They don't feel loved. He also said something that flies in the face of what many say. They want boundaries. They'll scream, why are you always on me? You're checking my grades. You're calling me on everything. And they know you care about me. So it was critical for them to have boundaries and to know that someone cared enough to pull those coattails. And when he said that they just wanted how important it was to put that hand on the shoulder, the arm around them, there are boys. There's, a, there's something that he always said.